and second. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. When the light up there goes red, John, we're live now here. So thanks very much, John, for taking time out of your schedule to uh, visit with us. I'm sure that you don't need much of an introduction here. <laughs> the father of the .NET New Project. <laughs> so anyhow, I see you've already got into the uh, eggnog with uh, Octane. So it should be pretty interesting to hear uh, your thoughts around um, where you've been and where you're going. So I'm going right. to leave the stage here and uh, I'll just be backstage and uh, you can uh, share your slides there if you have those. But good luck and thanks very much, man, for everything. Big community right. because of you. All from too much eggnog. Got to love that, <laughs> man. All right. I assume that uh, people can see my screen. Is that working? Yeah, I see it here. I'm going to go out. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to share with you uh, some information about uh, <laughs> a new open source project that I've been working on called Octane. And I'm going to try to connect the dots, I guess, between uh, DNN and Octane. Um, the session's called Migrating from DNN to Octane. And I know that probably raised a few eyebrows. Like some people would, would maybe think that... Um, covering this topic in this particular conference might not be appropriate. Um, and hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll see maybe why it's appropriate. Um, so I'm gonna try to do this, uh, this subject some justice. So Sean Walker um, was the cre original creator of .NET Nuke and the founder of DNN Corp. Um, I used to be a Microsoft MVP. I'm still an ASP insider creator of a new open source project called Octane. And I'm also busy working um, with the .NET Foundation as I'm the chair of the project committee. Oh, and I'm Canadian, just like Gifford. All right, so looking ahead, or, or basically, if we, if we think a little bit about migration and the, and the title of my session, um, there's a lot of different kinds of migration, right? There's probably what people were assuming I was going to talk about, which is a technical migration, right? Technically migrating from, you know, one type of technology to another or one product to another. Um, there's also, you know, personal migration where, you know, in your career, perhaps you need to explore some new skills or, you know, move forward and advance yourself. Um, there's community migration as well, where, you know, the community migrates from a point in time, maybe the circumstances or things change and they need to move forward. And so there's a migration that happens there as well. Uh, and customers. Customers are always afraid of having to migrate because typically a migration will end up costing them time and money. Um, but, but there's many different types of migration that you need to consider. And I'm going to explore some of those with you today. This um, session was somewhat inspired by a couple of blogs that I wrote uh, early in 2020. Um, these were focused on basically why I had decided to create a new open source project called Octane, um, and also some of the similarities between uh, DNN as it existed and, uh, and Octane. And so if you wanna, I guess, get some more background um, about those topics, you can read those blogs on the octane.org site, um, but I'm probably gonna cover a lot of the content in this session anyways. Um, one of the things I, um, I wonder if I can move this out of the way. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I want to make sure that I mention right up front here is, I mean, I was the original creator of .NET Nuke, um, and that was, you know, way back in late 2002. Um, it, it still blows my mind that something that uh, I created uh, that long ago is still relevant, is still being used as extensively as it as it still is today, that there still is a very large and passionate community around it. Um, there's a lot of customers that are still using um, DNN in very mission critical scenarios. Um, so it's it's been a long journey. And um, and I, I mean, I, I think as a community, we have to feel proud um, at how that technology has evolved over time, how it's adapted, how um, people have adopted it and continued to stick with it and been loyal to it. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not here to trash DNN. Uh, and I know that um, based on the, the title of my session, migrating from, from DNN to Octane, um, maybe that's what some people were expecting, but, but by no means do I wanna um, you know, talk badly about DNN because I think it's, it is a great technology platform and it's amazing the, the things that people are doing with it. 
Um, one thing I do want to touch on is after, I guess, I left DNN Corp., which was in 2014, um, the next major event that happened after that was when ESW Capital acquired um, DNN. Um, and that was, you know, the big announcement happened on, in September of 2017. Um, so that's, you know, more than three years ago now. Um, and there was a lot of excitement uh, at that time, you know, uh, signaling perhaps a new beginning or at least a, a major transition in the journey that uh, DNN had been on to that point in time. Um, there was a new CEO that came into place. His name is Andy Treba. Um, and I actually had the opportunity to fly out to Austin, Texas to meet with Andy. Um, I think it was in that September of 2017. And, I, and I'll have to say that, you know, Andy was very transparent with me about what the, the goals behind the acquisition were. Um, he basically explained what the business model for ESW Capital was. He explained the fact that he was pretty excited about the fact that uh, DNN had a lot of great customers, um, a lot of great logos using the product, and a lot of uh, very active members in the community. And, I mean, ESW Capital's model is that they acquire later stage technology companies where there is a very mature product uh, and a lot of customers and they service they focus on servicing the needs of those customers um, by providing you know basic maintenance and support um, which are what those larger enterprise customers need um, they tend to not invest much into the platform in terms of new enhancements or, or innovation um, but that's their business model and um, it, it does satisfy the needs of customers uh, and in this particular case, what he was quite interested in is if he could transition some of the, the workload that DNN Corp had traditionally been doing to the community. I mean, that, that was the goal right from the start of the acquisition was that, you know, handing over more and more of the responsibility to the community meant that the company wouldn't have to put out as much effort and could actually continue to make probably a greater profit than what had been made in the past. And so... That transition happened. I think that probably SW is capital is quite happy about what has happened because the the responsibility did almost fully shift over to the community, and they took over responsibility for developing the open source project. Um, that basically none of the employees of DNN Corp that existed at the time of the acquisition are around anymore. Um, and so, the, I mean, from a business model perspective, it was a it was a success. Um, Part of the shift in the responsibility involved the creation of some new committees. Um, so there was four, uh, four committees that were started at that time that the technology committee, which is mentioned here was one of them. And those committees have remained um, strong since that point in time in 2017 and continue to you know, provide the leadership within the DNN community um, through this transition. And so, I think for a long time, the community had been wanting to take more responsibility for the open source project and the uh, the decisions that were made in it. And, and that's exactly what's happened. So that, that transition or migration was quite successful. The big question that um, keeps coming up, I guess, or it came up right away after the, the, the acquisition by ESW Capital, uh, and it comes up constantly from people who are using um, the platform and developing for the platform is, you know, what's next? What, what, what is the roadmap look like for DNN? Like, where is this going? Um, and so that's been a tough question, I think, to answer and a tough question um, even to contemplate because there is so many factors involved in coming up with an answer. Um, if, we, if we look at sort of the timeline in terms of how long DNN has been around and the different iterations of Microsoft-based technology that it's been, that have happened over that time frame, obviously DNN was originally created on .NET um, 1.0, you know, and, and that, you know, started back in 2000. DNN was released in late 2002. The next major shift in the Microsoft technology landscape happened in 2009 when MVC was uh, released. And of course, there's, you know, there was a big shift at that point away from web forms to, to MVC. Um, .NET Core was introduced in 2014. Um, .NET Core obviously continued to support MVC. Um, it did not support um, web forms anymore. And there were some new models like Razor Pages, which were introduced at that point as well. Um, but going out even further, we're, we're looking, you know, a, we're a couple of weeks away from the next major iteration of .NET, which is, you know, rebranding of .NET Core to .NET 5. Um, that's happening on November 10th. 
And so, I mean, if you look at, at this timeline, you can see how where DNN started, uh, it's, you know, 18 years ago. 18 years is a long time when you think of, of technology. Um, typically, things have a shelf life of maybe five to 10 years. And so it's amazing that, that DNN has, you know, persisted for this length of time. And, and of course, it's, it's only been able to stay relevant because it's adapted to the times, at least somewhat. Um, <laughs> but the challenge is you still have a lot of customers out there that are doing things with DNN and they are concerned about the future. So they're concerned about what the roadmap look like, what's the you know future look like, what, what, what is the migration cost going to be at some point in time, or are they going to be able to stay on this path indefinitely? Well, we know that that's not feasible, right? You, you can't stay on a platform forever because some of the underlying assumptions that you make about the platform change over time, like the support model underneath it and, you know, the, the various factors which change over time. Um, one of the things that, that companies are very afraid of is the number of resources that are sort of skilled in a particular technology. Um, once it gets sort of past a certain point and starts declining in growth, then the number of resources that are available to actually work on, on the platform start declining as well. And that, that's a big risk for a business um, th because for one, the resources become more scarce, which means they become more expensive, um, which is probably, that's probably the biggest issue that, uh, that they need to contend with. And so they start planning for, you know, what is their next step? What is their risk mitigation strategy um, to deal with this particular problem? Worst case scenario, right? They don't want to go too far down this path and hit the end of the road, which is, you know, you're basically kind of stuck with very few options. And this is, you know, being at the end of the road um, at a time when you're not expecting it um, or you haven't planned ahead is kind of the, the worst situation you can be in because then you're forced into making um, sort of changes, I guess, to your overall business strategy, um, which probably aren't optimal, right? You, you haven't been able to sort of manage the change effectively yourself, and you're put into a reactive situation. And in the, you know, reactive situations are never a place you want to be. Uh, one of the signals I think that that went out to the market um, when it comes to just the .NET platform in general came out about 18 months ago. So basically, the you know .NET team proclaimed that .NET, .NET Core is the future at that point in time. They said that they weren't going to port any more features from .NET Core back to the .NET framework. Um, they basically said that if you're a web forms developer, that you should, you know, and you're building new applications, that you should be looking at Blazor because it has a component model which provides, you know, a similar kind of concept to what you're used to with web forms. Um, they also said that they were recommending that any new application that you create should be based on .NET Core and not, not be based on .NET Framework any longer. And they also announced that their, the, the last major release of .NET Framework was going to be .NET Framework 4.8. And after that point in time, it's only going to be serviced in, in, in the, or, or getting maintenance in the form of sort of security patches or those types of very minimal changes. Um, they're basically saying it is you know, kind of frozen at that point in time. It's not going to be enhanced anymore. Um, and I guess from that perspective, that's a good thing for a lot of applications which take a dependency on .NET Framework because, I mean, it's going to be rock solid for the foreseeable future. Um, but it also means that it's essentially a legacy platform or it's becoming a legacy platform. Um, and if you want to consider, you know, staying up to date on the newer platforms, that .NET Core is where you need to move. So when it comes to DNN, um, this raises a lot of questions, right? So if you're looking forward to the future, there's you know a lot of unknowns. You know where 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 is DNN going? What are the decisions that are being made to bring it forward? Um, if you look in the rearview mirror, things are very comfortable there. I mean, you have you know an ecosystem um, with a lot of extensions that are compatible uh, with the current version of DNN. You've got you know developers who are pretty comfortable with the development methodology for DNN, um, but you can't live in the rearview mirror forever, right? At some point, you have to move forward, and at some point, DNN um, 
needs to move forward or else if DNN doesn't move forward, the users of DNN and the customers of DNN have to find alternate um, paths to move forward as well. So again, thinking about DNN, uh, and th these were some of the discussions I think that happened um, after the acquisition by ESW Capital. And actually, even before that acquisition, there was discussions at DNN Corp itself about how do you take a platform that's built on web forms like DNN and move it forward? Um, and it's not easy. I mean, there is no easy decision there to be made because um, you either try to do some kind of a renovation strategy, um, which involves, you know, maintaining some compatibility. Um, but at the same time, then you won't be able to take advantage of all the new benefits and features of the newer platforms, or you have to detonate, which is, you know, tear it down to sort of some bare bones level and, and rebuild it. Uh, if you look at the overall sort of strategic way that product migrations are, are evaluated, I mean, you can think of them in a, in a bunch of different categories, all the way from, you know, the top, which is probably the least costly, which is, you know, say, taking an application and re-hosting it from, you know, one environment to another, all the way to the bottom, which is a full replacement, which is obviously the most um, expensive approach. But, I mean, that with that approach, of course, you can take full benefit of, of the new benefits of a new platform. And so when, I mean, when I was looking at this personally, I was thinking, uh, and I looked at, you know, .NET Core and um, the type of migration that would be required in order to move DNN forward. It, it really did focus on these bottom layers, right? Rearchitecture, rebuilding, and replace. Um, those seem to be the only real options to move a platform like DNN forward. Um, and that's largely because, you know, th there's, there is a lot of... Uh, functionality, I guess, that's been built into DNN over time that is dependent upon some of these legacy behaviors that are part of the platform. So because of that, it's very difficult to, you know, migrate the DNN platform forward in its current form and maintain compatibility. So what I looked at rather is an approach where basically you have to tear down DNN um, to sort of like the, the fundamental levels down to like the foundation. And I feel like the, th the foundation of DNN is solid. Like the concepts that were used as part of DNN are just as relevant today as they were 18 years ago when DNN was first created. So I'm not talking about the details of the technology. I'm talking about the, the, the concepts that we've all become familiar with over time in the DNN ecosystem. So the fact that it's a you know it's a modular platform that you build um, uh, components or, or slash modules and they integrate integrate seamlessly into the overall environment. Um, that sort of a, a model for developing applications is just as relevant today, if not more, than it was 18 years ago. The only thing that's changed is a lot of the techniques you would use to do that, and so that's where you know now that you've torn or, or now that you're thinking about the foundation, how can you build up from that foundation to build something new that still emulates a lot of the characteristics that were part of the DNN platform before? So if you look at the landscape today, it's like, what are you going to build on top of this platform? What technologies are you going to use? Um, by and large, I would say, so in the enterprise um, engagements that I've been working in in the last five or six years, most application developers have shifted over to the single page application um, model. So it's basically, you know, a client server model, which takes advantage of, you know, running JavaScript frameworks in the browser. Um, this model is quite attractive because it gives you a very responsive um, user experience for the end user, um, much more responsive than some of the older uh, sort of legacy server based um, technologies. And so everything has kind of moved in this direction, especially at the enterprise development layer. Um, and so, I mean, you've got a lot of choices that you can consider. The problem I have with all of these choices is that they all involve the use of JavaScript. And I mean, for me personally, and, and I think that there's obviously a large contingent in the Microsoft world, um, JavaScript is not, you know, the, the first language that you would gravitate to um, if you had to build something new that emulated the characteristics of DNN, right? We, 
if, if you look back on DNN, it was a server-based application and it was all based on C-sharp, well, originally VB, and then of course C-sharp, but it's all .NET. Um, .NET for the front end, .NET for the back end. And these technologies um, are something that the DNN community is very familiar with. And so if you wanna create something that um, you know, provides us a more simple migration path forward, it should use some of the technologies that that user base or those developers are familiar with. And so I didn't really think that JavaScript was a great approach. Um, luckily, Microsoft did come out with something in 2018 um, called Blazor. Um, and Blazor is basically a single page application framework um, that you can use to build SPA applications using C Sharp. So you based on .NET Core, so you can use C Sharp on the front end and on the back end. So it emulates a lot of the characteristics that um, that you've become familiar with, uh, with web forms technology. Single page application uh, has a, you know, a very distinct client and server model where the, um, you know, the client that, which is the browser itself makes an initial request to the server, gets back the initial payload of, you know, the, the markup for the page. Um, and then from that point on, most of the interactions happen between the client and the server over AJAX in terms of retrieving additional data and, and then um, displaying that on the UI. Most of the display aspects of uh, in the client itself are handled by JavaScript frameworks, and that's where you know they come into play. Um, but Blazor actually replaces that with a C sharp capability that allows you to replace a JavaScript framework with a, an equivalent that runs with C sharp. Um, the whole Blazor model is based on the concept of Razor components. Um, in a lot of ways, Razor components are very similar to the user controls that we used within the web forms model within DNN. So, I mean, you've got um, user interface uh, areas that are part of you know, your web interface. Each of those are basically a component, um, which is very similar to what a user control used to be. And a component contains uh, the HTML markup. Um, that should you know, basically be used for constructing the, the actual visual representation uh, on the page itself. And then it's got C-sharp classes as well for you know, hooking your events, writing your backend logic, um, which are associated to, to the, you know, the front end. It's got event binding, it's got property binding, and it's got um, routing and, and parameter kind of support all built in, which, um, so whether you're, you're, you've been, you know, you're comfortable creating um, user controls in a web forms type of environment, or you've migrated and you started using things like React or Angular, which also use a component model. Um, migrating to Blazor is actually pretty straightforward because it uses some very similar techniques that, you, that you're already accustomed to. One of the cool things about um, Blazor is you can host it in a few different ways. So you can create an application that you can actually run on the server itself. It still emulates the single page application approach. So it still provides a very responsive uh, user experience uh, for the end user. Um, but all of the logic actually runs on the server in this model. Um, and then there's also a, a web assembly model as well, where the, the actual logic itself is running within the, the browser itself using web assembly, which is a very innovative new technology um, that a lot of, uh, technology platforms are starting to adopt because um, it offers a lot of uh, benefits over traditional JavaScript. So that brings us to Octane. Um, and Octane is you know, positioned as a modular application framework for Blazor. I think the one thing that I'll mention about Octane, um, which I think a, a lot of people still find a bit confusing when they compare it to DNN, is that in the early days of DNN, like the very first versions of DNN that I created and that um, the open source community was was you know started upon. Um, it it was actually positioned as a web application framework. So it was positioned as as a foundation that you could build web applications on, and it provided a lot of the sort of foundational aspects like logging and authentication and you know things that are common kind of plumbing kind of functionality that's common across every web application. That's what DNN was. Um, later in its history. It, it sort of migrated its um, positioning to be more of a content management system. And when I refer to a content management system, I'm referring to features that are focused on managing content, things like content versioning, 
um, content localization, workflow. These are all sort of things that are very common to a content management system. Um, and, and so over time, DNN acquired more and more of that kind of functionality. And so, of course, some people use DNN for managing simple websites. They can, of course, do that. Um, there's a, a ton of other op options that are available, you know, in the industry now for managing simple websites as well. Um, all the way from, you know, uh, things that you would, of course, have to install yourself on a server all the way into sort of no-touch kind of cloud solutions. And so I purposely did not position Octane as a content management system. And that's because I think that there's already enough solutions that are CMSs in the market already. Like, there are so many well-funded companies that are creating advanced content management systems today. I, I don't see the benefit of creating yet another one. Um, however, in at least in the .NET ecosystem, I did see that there was not a lot of great application frameworks based on .NET Core that you could use for building modular applications. Um, and, and there was actually none, of course, that were available for Blazor. Uh, and so that was sort of the niche positioning for Octane. Um, so if you're a software developer and you're building uh, web applications, and you want to use new technology, and you want to build it in a modular fashion, and using many of the same techniques that you're familiar with from DNN, that is what Octane is for. So in terms of like what application frameworks provide, I mean, they provide you with a way to accelerate the development uh, of web applications and web services. Um, they, they try to provide you at least a set of conventions so that you have a standard way of building and deploying web applications. Uh, and they try to automate the overhead so that you don't have to, of course, you know, build the same functionality over and over again. You can reuse a lot of functionality that's already been written. And these are all hallmarks of the DNN uh, platform as well. So the mission for Octane is to provide a modular application framework which accelerates development of modern digital experiences. Uh, and some of the themes that are involved in, you know, the development of Octane are extensibility of course which is one of the you know the pillars of dnn but also speed so and of course speed has a lot of different attributes to it it could be you know the the, the actual execution speed of the framework itself um, and this is of course one of the areas where you know web forms based um, applications have have been criticized in recent years because you know the dotnet framework had a certain pattern that uh, you would follow in terms of creating applications uh, and speed was not one of the, or execution speed was what not one of the main, um, you know, pillars for for the .NET framework. It, it's been a major focus for Microsoft. In fact, it was one of the reasons why they created .NET Core, and .NET Core has a completely different philosophy around it than the .NET framework. Um, but execution speed was it was a huge, you know, push for Microsoft um, with .NET Core. And if you look at any of the benchmarks now for .NET Core, I mean, it it is incredibly fast, and they continue to push the limits of it. So. Um, that's also, of course, one of the um, the characteristics which Octane is focused on as well. And then productivity, of course, is another one. It's like, how how can we make developers more productive so they can build applications more easily and more quickly with, with rich functionality? Um, so Octane is a modular application framework. It was natively built on Blazor and .NET Core. Uh, it, allows to wrap, it allows you to rapidly create modern web applications. Um, and it provides a robust set of application building blocks. It's open source under an MIT license, so the same open source license as DNN, uh, and it is a, a member project in the .NET Foundation, same as DNN. Um, Octane also provides a bunch of additional capabilities that are not currently available in Blazor. And, and this, I mean, kind of harkens back to the early days of DNN as well, where you know DNN was pushing the limits on what ASP.NET sort of 1.x or 2.x we're providing out of the box and providing additional functionality. Um, Octane does the same thing on the Blazor environment. And so I say that it's inspired by DNN, and this goes back to what I was talking about, where if you tear down DNN to the, the bare foundation and you build it up again um, and use DNN as an inspiration, there's certain things that DNN did very, very well. Um, and so those are the characteristics that I wanted to carry forward into the Octane framework. Things like multi-tenancy, um, dynamic routing, 
a, a portal UI framework where you can, you know, interact with the application in a sort of what you see is what you get sort of style um, to, to dynamically be able to, you know, form your pages um, is something that was very unique to DNN. And it's something that uh, is part of Octane, uh, the modular architecture model. Um, so you can create, you know, third-party modules that install very seamlessly into the environment and, and act like first first party citizens within the environment. Um, the granular permission model that DNN had where you could define, you know, a, a variety of different types of permissions and assign them to, to users or roles. Um, it's not something that is, you know, at least in a dynamic way, isn't really possible um, with, with .NET Core and Blazor. Um, a customizable way to define themes. Um, so it's very similar to the skinning concepts that were in DNN originally. Uh, an administrative user interface with a lot of functionality that you get out of the box um, for free um, to manage a lot of the different entities that are part of the environment. Uh, and of course, because Octane is a, is a client server application using a single page application architecture, it has a full headless API um, and uh, you know, a, a, also a separate um, uh, logical repository as well. If we actually dig a little bit deeper into the differences between, or I guess actually the similarities between DNN and Octane, and we might as well start with the data model itself. So the, the, the data model for Octane is actually based on the DNN data model. Um, so basically, so where DNN has, you know, probably a hundred different tables that are part of a default installation, there are a certain number of tables that are core to the DNN architecture. Um, things like defining your sites, you know, the pages that are part of your sites, the modules that are part of your pages, the permissions um, that, def you know, define access to various entities, users, roles. Um, and you'll see that between the two environments, between DNN and Octane, it's basically almost a one-to-one a -one mapping between these different tables. They just have different names. So where DNN called things portals, in Octane it's called a site. In DNN, where it was called a tab, it's actually called a page in Octane. So took the opportunity to actually, you know, rename these entities to what they actually represent. Because um, I know in over time, the DNN documentation was updated to reflect um, what the, the true meaning of some of these database entities were. But the database itself, of course, has had to re keep, you know, backwards compatibility and retain their original names. And so... Um, I guess the main thing is that if you're familiar with the DNN data model, you're going to be familiar with the Octane data model because they're almost identical. The only difference, and this is where this red outline shows up, is that in Octane, the multi-tenant model um, allows you to actually have a separate physical database for each site that's part of your shared installation. Um, so rather than having all of your um, site information stored in a single shared database, you can actually have separate isolated databases for each site that are part of the same Octane installation. So that's that's one distinct difference. And to have that, it, it needs to have a master database where it stores all of the, you know, essentially what the portals were in DNN and the, and the aliases. And that from there, it's, a, it's able to map those to actual separate databases, if that's what you want. If you want to do things in a completely shared way, the way it's done in DNN, you can also do that as well in Octane. So you, you, you have additional capability that is not possible in DNN. As far as a system architecture approach, you've got a very distinct server and client architecture. Um, so this is, of course, using a single page application uh, architecture model. Uh, on the back end, on the server side, of course, you've, it's, it's using .NET Core and it's using EF Core. Um, it's actually using, you know, very standard EF Core for data access. It's not using stored procedures for anything. Um, so it's a, it's a very sort of modern approach to developing an application. It has its own defined repository, um, which, of course, is built on top of EF Core. It's got its own REST API, which provides you know the full headless API for the for the backend um, set of services that are available. Uh, of course, and it uses Swagger to expose um, those APIs so that I mean they're all documented. It's also got its own scheduled job system um, using the .NET Core um, I scheduled uh, service 
capability that's part of the .NET Core infrastructure. Um, so where you would have you know background jobs in DNN, um, you have got the same kind of a capability in Octane, although using the more modern technology stack. Um, you would have modules as well. A module, of course, would in the Octane world needs to be split into both a client side and a server side component um, so that they interact with one another and each module can have its own API. And like I already mentioned, you can have multiple databases, like a database per site, or in some cases you might put you know, multiple sites in a single database, you've got that flexibility. On the client side, we're using Blazor. And so it, um, on the client side, Octane can run on both Blazor server or Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, it's as simple as changing one configuration setting in, in the, you know, the app settings.json file to define which hosting model you wanna use. On top of that, we've got a set of, of services, which are API wrappers, which you know make it very simplistic to call the backend API um, using you know a sort of a, a, a strongly typed set of um, of methods that provide strongly typed data back. Um, we've got our Octane multi-tenant portal UI framework, which is very similar to, um, of course, what the DNN environment provides. You can have multiple sites; each site can have as many virtual pages as you want. Um, you can define themes, which you apply to the pages. And then, of course, you build your modules as reusable Razor components. Um, and it's, of course, designed to be multi-channel in terms of the capabilities. The UI, by default, of Octane uses Bootstrap. So it, it, it comes with sort of that responsive design capability kind of baked into it. From a routing perspective, um, the same way that you had um, server-side routing in DNN, routing based on the domain name, um, so it could basically do the lookup of the domain name and map it back to the database to determine what content um, as part of your site needs to be um, rendered. The same sort of model works in, in Octane. Of course, it's client-side routing, though, because it's a single-page application architecture. And then it, of course, takes the page route as well um, and then maps that. So basically, routing works in the identical way as it works in DNN. Um, the portal UI framework, identical to the way it works in DNN. So there's a virtual sort of a page. You apply a theme to it. The theme is actually built out as a Razor component, same way that in DNN, a, a theme was uh, created as a, um, a user control. So essentially, you know, the, the base aspect of, of, um, of ASP.NET web forms was that you would use user controls for componentization. And uh, in Blazor, you use Razor components. But I mean, they're sort of a one-to-one -one conceptual mapping. Um, your theme defines as many panes as you want. So using the same nomenclature that was used in DNN, you define as many panes as you want. You still have the concept of a container that's injected dynamically into a pane, and then the module, which is um, injected into the container. Um, it doesn't mention it here, but containers are also Razor components. Modules are Razor components. So, I mean, this conceptual diagram has been shown in many, many .NET Nuke presentations in the past. Um, and so, again, Octane was inspired by DNN and uses the same concepts. Module routing, so the ability to define, um, you know, additional parameters that you can pass to uh, the different components that are part of your module, so that you can surface different user interfaces as part of it. So the the same exact approach, where you have a module ID in the URL, and you also have what was called a, like a, a control key, um, are part as part of the URL gets mapped back to the database and tells the, the framework which component needs to be rendered. And so this is all dynamic and it's all stored in the database um, the same way that DNN worked. And so when you build out your pages through the, the portal UI framework, basically creates all this configuration data in the database, the same way that DNN did it, and then it surfaces things dynamically. Um, module architecture for, for Octane is a little bit different than DNN because of course it is a a single page application. So you would build out your client side project. Um, typically, so this there's three different projects that which make up a module. There's the client side, which is where your Razor components are built. 
Um, you would also build out your, your services here, which are your wrappers for calling your backend APIs. Um, typically, what we've been using is a shared models um, project as well. And the models project uh, is shared between the client and the server so that you can have one set of models which are shared between them. This is sort of the, the recommended approach that most of the templates use in, in Blazor. So this is why um, Octane used this approach as well. Um, and then, of course, on the back end, you've got your, your web API controllers, which you create. And then you have your repositories, which are interacting with the database. Um, of course, you also still have to create um, the ability to provision uh, your tables into the, the database itself. Um, and so there's, there's the capability to do that, and it works in a very similar manner as what DNN does. Um, packaging your modules is also very similar. Um, but there is a, somewhat of a subtle difference when it comes to Octane. So um, you have the ability to create an assembly which contains one or more modules. So in DNN, where you'd have the, the, the concept of a, like a, a group of modules that could be installed as one module package, and that was largely controlled by the, the manifest file that was concluded um, within the, the package, for the module. In Octane, it's actually a little bit different in the sense that you actually would create a solution um, and you'd put, you know, multiple, you could put multiple module projects that are part of that solution. Uh, and, then, and then you could compile them all up into the same assembly. And at runtime, when this assembly is installed, Octane is able to figure out how many, like all of the different modules which are contained within the assembly. And, and then of course, expose them um, through the user interface to the user. So I guess at the lowest level, a module can contain one or more Razor components, just like in DNN, a module can contain one or more user controls. Um, a module has the ability to implement an iModule interface. So this is another subtle difference between um, Octane and, and DNN, where in DNN, like I said, you had that manifest file, which was like an XML file, which would describe some of the metadata, which was part of the module. Uh, in uh, in Octane, you actually have an interface that you implement in code. Um, so it's actually then gets compiled into the assembly itself. And uh, Octane looks for that um, implementation of the interface rather than looking for some extra files. And this is sort of one of the philosophies of Octane is to keep things more encapsulated and to have a lot less extraneous um, files that you'd have to manage as part of your, your module development efforts. Um, so like I said, an assembly can contain one or more modules, and then you would package your assemblies into NuGet packages. So these are standard NuGet packages, um, and they can, can contain one or more assemblies. Um, of course, a NuGet package also contains a, um, you know, a new spec.json file, which defines the contents of the NuGet package. Um, and, and actually, Octane allows you to upload the NuGet package to NuGet.org. Um, and then it actually allows you to download um, modules directly from NuGet.org into your Octane environment and install them directly. So th in the packaging area, there is some subtle differences over the way that it worked uh, in DNN, but it's conceptually the same concepts. So you it's very familiar as well. Uh, from an actual deployment perspective, you would build your module, which is in the middle here. And like I described, a module... Um, would have a client project, it would have a server project, and it would have a shared project, um, and then the associated assets that are part of those. Um, when you basically build these, you'd have you know a, a server assembly, a client assembly, and a shared assembly. All of these assemblies would get placed into the bin folder. Um, so in the development environment, you know they'd go into the Octane server bin folder. And then when you start up your Octane environment, it actually iterates through the bin folder, finds all the Octane modules, um, and then it exposes them through the UI dynamically. Um, modules can also have static resources, which are part of them. So this could be CSS files, JavaScript files. Um, those are the, 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 the most common, or, or images as well. So any sort of static um, content that you might want to include as part of your module. They have to be included in a WW root folder. Um, this is sort of the standard Blazor component library approach. Um, there's a convention within 
within um, Octane that there's a modules folder and then you would actually name a subfolder, which is the same name as whatever your module name is. And that's where you put your static assets. Um, if you, you, these assets actually need to be deployed to the same www root folder within the Octane environment. Um, if you package up your module as a, as a NuGet package um, and then install it into Octane, it will unpack it and put the files into the necessary locations just like it worked in DNN. Um, and of course, um, in, run, in the runtime environment, it's slightly different because this is just the way that .NET Core works, but it will also take care of, of you know, putting things in the appropriate locations as well. The community in Octane is managed through the GitHub repository. Um, so the open source project is located in the Octane organization. The main project, which is the framework, uh, is there. If you go to the organization, you can also find additional sample projects as well. Some sample theme project, a sample, couple of sample module projects, um, which are really helpful in terms of uh, getting started with uh, developing. In terms of the roadmap for Octane, um, the original proof of concept that I created um, uh, was in November of 2018. And this was back when Blazor was still in preview five. So this was before Blazor was even released as a real project. I think it was still classified as a, maybe even experimental at this point in time. Um, the official announcement for Octane was on May 5th, 2019. And that's when the open source project was created on GitHub. Um, we had our official 1.0 release on May 20th, 2020. So just you know about six months ago. That was at the same time that .NET Core 3.2 was re released. And this, this .NET Core 3.2 release provided official support for both Blazor WebAssembly and Blazor Server. So we thought it was the appropriate time for Octane to be released. Since then, we've had a number of you know, simple sort of maintenance releases. Uh, and there's been actually enhancements that have been included in these releases as well, because it's a fairly new product. And so there's a lot of room um, for improvement. Um, a lot of enhancements can be made. Our next version that we're working towards is we actually have already migrated Octane to .NET 5. So we have a version of Octane, uh, which is going to be our 2.0 version, which is going to be released on November 10th at the same time that .NET 5 is released. So um, dot, uh, Octane is very well positioned to be aligned with Microsoft's roadmap for the future. Um, it already runs on .NET 5. Um, Cool thing is like any of the modules that were written for .NET Core 3.1 or, th or 3.2 um, actually are still run on .NET 5. So there is backward compatibility for the modules um, that is provided already. Not really something that I guess was, was well, partly because Octane is taking the same approach as DNN and that we don't, we, we try to avoid breaking changes in the framework itself, but also Microsoft avoided breaking changes between .NET 5 and .NET Core 3.1 for the most part. So that was, I mean, a big benefit. Um, in terms of doing a, a quick demo um, of Octane. So if you download the source code from the, the GitHub repo um, and open it in Visual Studio, you can use Visual Studio Community Edition if you want to. That's the free version of Visual Studio that Microsoft provides. Um, you should use the preview edition uh, of Visual Studio um, because the main repo for, for Octane is already migrated to .NET 5. So you're going to have to install the dependencies uh, of .NET 5 um, to, in order to run Octane. All those instructions are located on the GitHub homepage. So it'll give you instructions on what you need. Anyways, once you've got the source code, you can open up the solution. You can build the solution. There should be no problem building the solution within Visual Studio. Um, you've got the, the client, the server, and the shared projects, which are the projects which I kind of already described um, is, that are part of the architecture. If we go into the server project, and we find the app settings.json file. I can actually, I've already had it installed here, but if I remove this um, default connection string um, and save it and then run the application, what's going to happen is it's going to recognize that I don't have a database configured and it's going to display a, an installation wizard to me as part of the the, uh, the startup process. So I get an install wizard page. I'm going to just choose to use the local, which is local DB, which is, um, you know, SQL server, but, you know, the, the, the local version of it. I'm going to create my initial um, uh, administrator account. Um, and when I run this, it basically, 
installs all of the necessary um, database schema into this database um, that is dynamically created. And I'm up and running with, with Octane. So, I mean, at, once you're running in the Octane environment, you've got you know a variety of pages which were created by default. Um, you'll notice that you've got a few options up in the upper right corner. If, if I choose to go into sort of the edit mode by choosing this pencil, you'll see that you can see that there's you know a content pane that's outlined on this page. You can see that there's a module with content displayed here, another module here, another module here. Similar to DNN, um, you've got the module actions menu, which you hover over and you get access to some of the similar capabilities that you have in the DNN environment. Um, if you want to edit content for this particular module, you can do it. And this is where some people obviously get tripped up in, in, in what um, Octane is intended for. The, the, every, every web application typically has the need to display some arbitrary content uh, in the user interface. And so there is a default module that's part of the Octane installation, which is you know, for providing or displaying this type of content. That doesn't mean it's a content management system. Um, I would say that the vast majority of other modules that you would you know, uh, add to pages within your site would be actual you know, functionality. Um, for building out a uh, you know a web application, um, so don't don't get confused. The fact that there happens to be a HTML text module with a rich text editor that this is a content management system. That's not really what it's intended for. Um, if I go into the other um, option that's in the upper right corner here, um, it's the it surfaces a control panel. Control panel provides you with access to things like you would typically have in DNN. So the ability to manage, you know, add pages to this site because you can add as many pages as you want, edit pages, um, you can delete pages, you can add modules to the page. Um, by default, um, I've got a few modules, but by default, the HTML text module is the only module which is shipped with. I have built a, another project for the .NET Foundation for managing projects. I've got a blog module, but this is where your modules would be. Um, surfaced and then you of course you just choose which pane you want to add them to this is all very very consistent with the way that dnn works you've also got access to an administrative dashboard if you click that um, you've got access to a bunch of additional functionality things that you should basically know and expect from the dnn environment things like how to manage your you know your site settings these are all your different site settings um, page management, user management. Um, you can have extensible profiles, uh, role management, uh, file management, cycle bin, event log um, for managing tenants. So this is where you would define your different tenants are equivalent to databases. So if you want to have multiple databases for each, like a database for each site, this is where you define them. Um, you can see all your modules, your, you can manage your themes, your background scheduled jobs. Um, yeah, so SQL manager, so you can run SQL against your databases. So all the same kind of capabilities that um, you've come to expect from DNN are all present in Octane as well. Um, so I think that th that gives you sort of a, a sense of what the Octane environment um, is capable of. Um, if I go back to my slides for a moment. Um, the big question, and this is like the elephant in the room, I guess, <laughs> um, is, you know, is Octane a fork of DNN? Um, I get this question a lot, right? Um, and I guess, so, I mean, I, I had to actually look up what the definition of a fork is. So an open source fork is a version of an open source project that is developed along a separate work stream from the main trunk. According to that definition, I guess Octane is a fork. Of, of DNN, um, but I mean, you could come to your own conclusion about that. So I would say that, um, like, I, like I started off this presentation, um, DNN is a very capable platform and there is you know, a lot of folks that are using DNN um, and I, I expect that um, there's still gonna be a lot of use of DNN in the coming years. Um, you know, there's no reason to panic or move off of DNN However, you do need to be thinking about the future and, and some of the aspects that I shared in this presentation about just technology in general and, and the fact that, you know, te technology, certain types of technology do have a life cycle that they go through. 
Um, and the technology platform that DNN is built on is now considered to be a legacy platform. Um, and so you need to be thinking about, you know, how you move forward into the future. And this is relevant for both users of the platform, developers of the platform, developers of third-party extensions for the platform. You know, it, it affects everyone. And so I want to thank you for your time today. Um, I also want to mention that I have a, a session at .NET Conf um, on November the 12th, which is a few weeks away. Um, this is the first time I've, I've had the opportunity to speak at .NET Conf, and I'm going to be doing a session um, on building dynamic applications with Blazor, which is essentially a more in-depth talk about the dynamic capabilities of Blazor, and of course, using Octane as the, the example. Very good. There was a question that was fielded from Stefan Coleman. Is an extension like Scanner Provider also a module in Octane? Uh, is an is an extension? Yeah. If you look in the backstage chat here, is it is an extension like Skin or Provider also a module in Octane? Uh, skin is yes. We we call them themes, but yes, yeah. uh, you you can build third party skins um, in Octane. Um, oh. And they just the same way that they are in DNN, they're a user control. In Octane, they're uh, a Razor component. There's an example of a of a of a third party um, theme that's in the the Octane repository that you can use, look at as an example. Providers, o Octane does not use the provider model. Um, that there was there was actually so it's funny how Microsoft introduced the provider model as part of you know .NET framework. Um, it got used a lot, um, but in later years, as .NET Core was introduced, um, there was a lot of feedback that the provider model is not, it's like an anti-pattern. It's not a great pattern for a lot of things, and it was used too much, and so you don't see a lot of use of it in .NET Core, um, and, and yeah, Octane doesn't really use it. Okay, and Cheryl Bearden asks, looks very interesting. Can you use Angular or React to do client development? Um, so I think that Daniel Mettler is going to probably talk yeah. about this in his next session, but the reality is it's difficult to do that because Blazor itself, I mean, one of the main reasons why you would choose to use a technology like Blazor is because you don't want to use JavaScript. Um, and in fact, the, the, the Blazor development model doesn't make it easy to use JavaScript within your components. So like if you put a script tag within your your Razor component, Blazor will not deal with it. Um, you, in order to use JavaScript, you actually have to use something called JavaScript interop. And so there's a way that you can communicate between JavaScript and C-sharp code. So it's supported, but it's, it's not as straightforward as what you're used to in building you know, the traditional kind of server-based applications and sprinkling in some JavaScript. Understood. Not by me, but I'm sure Cheryl or somebody technical. <laughs> yeah, and I, I hope that I think that that Daniel will dig into that area more because he sent a question to me this week that was very much along those lines. Yeah, and he mentioned that too. So, thank you very much, Sean, for uh, being you, man. This looks All like right. a nice twin. I'm glad that you're uh, moving forward with things, and you know, I'm sure everybody's going to be keeping an eye on you as you uh, as you keep moving forward. I hope your community thrives and. You know, hopefully there'll be some synergies between both communities as uh, you're the common component. Yeah, and there's, of course, no reason why people can't be part of, of both communities, right? Um, that's actually probably more likely. You're going to have implementations of DNN that you're supporting. Um, and if you decide to, you know, experiment with Octane or, or use it in new applications, you can be part of the Octane community as well. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, there's a million people out there that would rather grab a WordPress instance for a simple, you know, uh, SPA or something like that, right? Or, right. Yeah. Uh, so for lighter weight. And that's the other thing, too. I, th I imagine going back to basics, the foundation, um, we're looking at eliminating a lot of the, uh, I don't want to call it bloat, but I'm pretty much bloat, right? There's a lot of modules that were fired into uh, the .NET Nuke environment that are there by default. And those, uh, you know, may or may not serve uh, the purpose as far as, you know, you want yeah. the solution, 
something that fits the problem. So yeah, so I, I, yeah, I guess I, I the the one question I I have I guess is I'm not sure how you would approach um, a modernization a modern uh, modernization of DNN in a different way than what Octane has already done. Um, I'm, so I mean that's maybe a question more for the community leaders that are part of DNN at this point, but um, I am not I'm not sure. You know, if, if you wanted to move DNN forward into the future on .NET Core, if there is another path that you would take that is much different than what Octane has already taken. Well, maybe they'll have to uh, fork. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think we got Daniel Mettler, Mettler in the wings here. Daniel, do you want to you All right, come I'll, on? I'll stop sharing. Oh, sure thing. Okay, I'm going to stop broadcasting for about... 30 seconds, 45 seconds, folks. And that just gives me a clean recording from one uh, from one uh, broadcaster to the next. So I'll be back here in a 